problem and see um, or this issue, just how you guys are feeling about this and how we can improve the campus community around this topic and feel more um, um, comfortable with where we stand instead of seeing um, multiple issues or emails coming out your way every now and then. We would, we really, we just wanted to hear a uh, student opinion and um, include administrators as well because we think that this community is uh, it's all inclusive. So, also, um, yeah. On that note, thanks for coming. And um, on behalf of student government, I'm going to introduce to you the vice president of student development. Our first speaker is Dr. Kelly. I'm glad to see so many people uh, came out tonight uh, for this conversation. Um, right, my remarks are fairly, fairly brief. I think the most important speakers are going to be kind of the students and the questions that you have and how you, how you want to kind of guide this conversation and what you want to talk about. But I want to talk about, I guess, an issue of care. One of the things that um, is probably an issue on every college campus is the issue of alcohol. Um, there are students who are going to drink, there are students who are going to not drink, there are students who are going to abuse alcohol, uh, and there are students who won't. Regardless of the reason, alcohol is not really the, the issue. Alcohol in and, of it, in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, truth be told, I drink myself. <laughs> um, so I, I know what can happen with, uh, when you drink. For me, the issue really is the secondhand effects that happen sometimes when some people drink. And it's the kind of community that gets created. So whether it's the sexual assaults, the physical assaults, the fighting, some of the violence, theft, destruction of property, people missing classes, people taking care of a roommate or a friend because that friend was intoxicated or uh, might be sick, so someone had to watch the person. It's that sort of thing that I think tears apart the community. And it's the really serious cases where, forbid we lose a, we lose a student. When I sent the email out, at first, no response. And I wasn't sure if it was because no one checks their email, or if it's because people thought, well, it's not really a big issue that I need to be thinking about. For the most part, many of the cases where students are transported to the hospital or assaulted walking down the street, some of them are sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So it's not just first year students, because often we can go right to this assumption that, oh, it's a first year student, and first year students don't know how to do X, Y, and Z. First year students can't handle their alcohol. And that's not necessarily the case. We have many upper class students who are getting themselves into similar situations, walking home alone at night when they're heavily intoxicated. And my questions are, you know, how do we care for each other as friends, as fellow Loyolans? I think this is an important thing for us to consider. Now clearly, there's the law. And so if you're not 21, you shouldn't be drinking that sort of thing. And as a university, we're going to enforce the law. At the same time, we also want there to be responsible use for the people who choose to drink. And we want there to be support for the people who choose to not. So those are just my kind of, some of my opening comments. I really wanted to be brief, but I know that we're going to be hearing from students and other administrators as we go along. Um, I'm going to be here. I really do want this to be a conversation. I want people's questions to be answered. I want people to put, put that stuff out there. It shows the strength of our community when we can really engage in these questions and answers. So thanks. Okay, next up we're going to have a student speaker who's been affected, or I'm just going to let him tell your story. Um, here's Brendan for you, one of the sophomores here at Loyola. sophomore here at Loyola. Um, I'm a psych pre-med major and uh, I live in Georgetown. Um, earlier this year, 
around uh, the time, 9-11, that weekend, um, I was having a party in my dorm room. Um, it started off like a, you know, just a usual get together. Um, we were playing uh, beer pong uh, in my room. Um, you know, I had a couple beers, and then um, I decided to drink uh, some harder liquor. Um, I'd gone through maybe, I'd gone through a fifth of uh, rum within an hour. So um, during the course of the party, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I felt fine. So I, you know, decided to stop drinking. Um, the problem was I forgot to count how much I drank. So uh, through the course of the night, I uh, felt fine enough to drink some more. Um, I was then challenged to a chugging contest uh, with pure vodka. Um, me and one of my friends poured it in uh, two solo cups. Um, we then uh, uh, we then started to chug. Um, he passed out before he could finish his cup. I had completely finished mine. Then I had finished his because I felt fine. Um, then I continued to pour myself another cup and I finished that one. And there was a little left in the handle, so I just finished that off. So in the course of that night, maybe three hours, I would finished a handle of vodka, a fifth of rum, and a few beers. Um, I was fine for about 15 minutes, and then I was talking to one of my friends, and I passed out. Um, they thought I was done for the night, so they put me to bed. Um, then I started getting sick, I started making noises, so my friends thought I was going to throw up. So they carried me to the bathroom, tried to get me to throw up, um, tried to get me to eat some crackers or water, but I was uh, unresponsive. So what they did was they put me to bed and um, thought I was going to be okay. Um, my one roommate, who uh, uh, I'm not going to say his name during this talk, um, he was walking the other kid home when that other kid started throwing up and he passed out and he was unresponsive. So my roommate uh, pressed the emergency button to contact uh, campus police and uh, he realized that I was in worse shape than that other kid. So he rushed up to my room and checked on me. At this point I was unresponsive. Um, I started getting puffy from the amount of alcohol I drank and um, they were really worried about me. So uh, campus police came, they tried to wake me up, but I was unresponsive. Um, I was then transported to St. Francis in Evanston. Um, I was in an alcohol-induced coma for 30 hours. Um, I couldn't breathe on my own, so I had a breathing tube. And uh, on arrival, my blood alcohol level was 0.755. Um, 0.8 is death. Um, I was uh, in a coma for 30 hours. Um, I was unresponsive, and uh, there was a great chance that I was going to die because of this. Um, luckily, I, uh, I woke up after the 30 hours. Um, I uh, could react, I could talk, I couldn't breathe on my own for another 24, but the fact that I was still awake was uh, pretty good. Um, then, uh, so I was in the hospital for three days after that. Um, I had an infection from throwing up into my lungs because I couldn't open my mouth when I was passed out. Um, they said that if I had another shot or two, um, I would have been dead. And uh, I, it's a miracle that I don't have any long-term liver or brain damage. So um, this just happened to me at the beginning of the year, and it was just a normal party. Um, usually I don't, you know, partake in drinking that much, but, you know, it just happens so quickly. Everything just spirals out of control so fast. I mean, a lot of my friends were stunned when they heard that it was me in the hospital because I'm one of the smarter drinkers in my group of friends. Um, just, I mean, if you don't keep count of what you're doing or if you don't pay attention close enough, um, something could drastically happen within a matter of minutes that could alter the rest of your life. I know um, it altered my family. It changed like the way my friends uh, do things on campus. A lot of them have stopped drinking since the accident. And uh, a couple of them are afraid to start drinking again because they're afraid it's going to happen to them.
So if you think that something like this can't happen to you, you're wrong. Because I thought the same thing you guys thought. I thought that if I was smart enough with my consumption, that if I was smart enough um, to uh, you know, say enough is enough, that I'd be fine and nothing could happen to me. But uh, I can tell you that that's very wrong. Anything can happen at any moment if you're not smart enough. Uh, if you guys aren't paying attention or you don't have a strong enough group of friends to help you out when a situation like this arises, then uh, you could be in trouble. I mean, I, I'm i so lucky to be alive right now talking to you guys in this forum. Just, you know, if someone had act, came five minutes later or if my friend didn't act as soon as he did, or if I had taken one or two more shots, I wouldn't be here right now. So uh, just remember that, you know, when you hear these stories about kids who drink and the effects that they could have on you, just, you know, try to imagine what would happen, if, or the situation, what would happen if it was you. Like, how would you react, or what would happen? Because I guarantee you, I if something didn't happen, if, I'm sorry, um, if everything didn't happen the way it did, I'd be dead. So it just remember to think of, put yourself in that person's shoes when you hear the story of how you know they drank too much and they woke up, you know, somewhere that they didn't know, or they woke up in the hospital, or something bad happened that night. Because you may not think it could happen to you, but it can. So uh, thank you. Dana Brodnax from the Student of Conduct and Conflict Resolutions. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, sounds like it. Good evening. Um, again, my name is Dana Brodnax. I serve as a coordinator in the Office of Student Conduct and Conflict Resolution. Um, you know, kind of like how Dr. Kelly said, I really feel like this time is um, for you. And uh, you just cannot believe how um, grateful and impressed and, and how much I admire um, the student body here, particularly the USGA, that um, they would take this initiative. This is an example of uh, true student leadership and where this energy and efforts should absolutely come from, um, from the students, um, for the students, by the students. So thank you so much for giving your time to this. Thank you so much for giving your attention to this. Um, I'm extremely grateful to, to see you here. Um, my role on campus is, is really interesting. Um, when we have issues of um, conflict or university policy violations, students end up um, in our office talking to uh, conduct administrators or across campus. <coughs> Um, I didn't prepare um, a particular presentation, so to speak, for this. This is really just off the cuff. Um, I want to say that, uh, to your statement, Brenda, about your, your friend making that action and um, it saving your life, that is what we call the Good Samaritan, and that is what impacts our Good Samaritan policy. It's not about um, so much the policy. It's not so much about um, following the rules. It's about being that student at Loyola University who cares and is responsible, and we take care of each other, and we do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Um, you see the shirts around. I'm glad that you all have them. I want to take this minute to make sure you all understand the Good Samaritan policy. So as you go forth and tell your friends about it, you exercise this thing, you encourage others to do the same, um, you really understand what it is. Okay. So the Good Samaritan policy, um, three things that you, you must know for you to um, be covered by the Good Samaritan policy. But first we get there, let me explain to you that the Good Samaritan policy is a policy that we have in place for situations like what Brendan talked about. For situations where we've gone too far. For situations when um, our peers, our friends, people that are Loyola students 
um, things get out of hand and they get out of control. And we have to step up and act and do the right thing, the responsible thing. And so this policy is in place so you don't have to think twice about consequences and repercussions. Like, yes, there are responses to the decisions that we make, but it's more important to us that you know how to take care of each other. It's more important to us that you call for the help. Um, it's more important to us that you seek the help and come forward. So, in bold print, in incidents of crisis or medical emergency, Loyola students are expected to care for themselves and care for others in the Loyola community by getting help from appropriate officials when violations of the community standards have occurred. In this case, we're talking campus safety. We're talking um, rest life, especially if we're on campus during the day, maybe even wellness, any staff member, where you ever can get help, please do. What you want to know about this policy is that if there's an incident where you are calling for help to assist someone, that what goes off the table for you is a Category A alcohol or Category A B drug. Good Samaritan policy applies to alcohol, applies to drugs, and applies to sexual assault. That's important for you to know. The next one. In order to really exercise or enact this policy, three things have to happen. One, you have to call for help. And call for help immediately. Don't wait. Like in this incident, um, time matters. Time is of the essence. Do not waste time. Call for help. If you do not have this phone number in your cell phones, please pull out your phone numbers and please pull out your cell phones and take it now. The campus safety number is 773-508-6033. That'll put you in touch to dispatch. That's how you will get help. 773-508-6039. You have to call for help or call 911. The second is that you have to stay there with the person that we're concerned about. You need to stay with them. Make sure they're okay. Never leave their side. Know what's going on with them. Never leave them behind. Never abandon them. You stay with them. And thirdly, as a follow-up, we're going to ask to speak with you. We need to know how you're doing. We need to know how you feel about this. You need to come talk to um, one of the conduct administrators about the incident. Those are the three things that you really need to know about the Good Samaritan policy. Um, if, if, if anything, if there's an outcome, um, we might ask you to, to uh, participate in some health intervention. We may ask you to be involved in some kind of um, educational or developmental um, experience. But before any of that, we need you to make sure you take care of each other and you take care of yourselves. All that stuff we learned in Alcohol EDU, like it matters, it counts, we call those things. Um, if you're not sure, ask somebody. There's plenty of people on the campus who want to talk to you about responsible drinking. Um, the next slide is really about the, the, the student promise. And really in short, um, you all are already examples of what it means to live out the student promise. The way you are caring for yourself to demonstrate excellence and to challenge yourself, you're here today, and that matters a lot to us. The also is uh, care for others. The care for others piece, um, in this context, we're talking about the health and wellness of each other, but it's very important that we also understand that that care for others is also about like embracing differences. And then there's care for community, where we are looking and striving to take an active role in, in a just world. And, I, and in this vein, I would even ask um, health, and that we look that we are all well and taking care of each other. So just so you know, like this Good Samaritan policy is absolutely in line with um, the student promise. And I thank you so much for um, your leadership and your engagement in this process. If you ever have any questions, please do not hesitate to come by our office. Um, I'm interested in questions now, actually. I'm not really quite sure of the, of the format of this, but if you have questions about the Good Samaritan policy or about our office, um, I don't mind answering them. Sarah, how does that work for you? Okay, so we're gonna take questions at the end. I'll be here for the whole um, event for the evening, so please uh, look for me if your question does not get answered. Uh, 
today and come visit us at the table too. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dana. Thanks for the big applause. Um, next, we're going to have a couple drawings. Just to thank you guys for being here and whoever entered their name in. Sorry if those who I cut you off, but we're going to have just just one or two right now. So, okay, just one. And this is for Red Mango. Carolyn Peters, you still here? I guess I could stand up. One thing that was dropped in our suggestions box over here from an anonymous student, um, I think the biggest piece of advice students should receive is to always have a sober buddy. In college, the drinking scene is pretty inevitable and the students are tempted all the time. But the most preventative drinking device would be to have somebody who can take control of the situation when something occurs. So that's advice, not from us, but from someone amongst you guys. And then also, um, our next student speaker, uh, just talking pretty generally about alcohol on campus, is Marco Rodriguez. Uh, like Sarah said, my name is Marco. Coming into Loyola, I didn't think that the drinking scene here was that big. I thought like there was a little bit of drinking here, a little bit there. But now that I'm here, I see that all the mischief and irresponsibility on campus that has happened within the eight weeks. To have 15 hospitalizations a couple weeks ago is crazy. I think as a student body, we need to take care of ourselves, take care of one another. Not only think of you, but think of the guy next to you. And I'm glad that Sarah and her committee had put this forum together. We need to be more informed. And there's no better way than to bring the student body and faculty together. So I'd like to thank Sarah and her committee for the hard work she's put into this. And I give you guys a piece of advice that don't leave anyone behind. If you're at a party, don't leave anyone behind. Leave with the people you came with. If you're drinking in the dorms, make sure you're always with those people. Because sure, you weren't one of the 15, but you could be one of the 20, God forbid. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. And then next, next I'm gonna have Kevin Meyer from the Wellness Center. and. Um, just, I think this question really applies. Someone dropped this in our suggestion box. Um, I guess it's not a suggestion, but um, <laughs> how accurate are the statistics of how many students at Loyola drink? So I think that's an important question that Kevin here is <laughs> kind of gonna touch on for you. So I thought I would read that. All right. I'm not a big fan of speaking in the microphones, but um, my best here. Um, so yeah, statistics. That does kind of lead into what I did want to touch on. Um, I'm going to try not to echo everything that was said already, um, but I think what Dr. Kelly said um, by saying that this is a choice, I think that's something we all have to remember is that drinking or choosing to drink is a huge choice that everyone has to make in their life. Um, and to start off with some statistics, um, nationally what we find reported is that one in five college students choose not to drink. Um, which is great. That's a huge percentage of students nationally that report not drinking at all. For all different reasons, whether it's a health reason, a religious reason, or just some personal reason. Um, here at Loyola, we actually have a higher percentage of students that report not drinking at all. Um, we get this data every other year, whether it's from the National Collegiate Health Assessment or the Core Alcohol and Drug Survey. Um, this happens to come from the Core Alcohol and Drug Survey. And what the numbers are reporting is that one in four Loyola students choose not to drink. Um, it might be kind of hard to wrap your head around that, but look around and realize that maybe when you're out drinking with people, it's the same people over and over again. You might not see those you know, 
25% of students that are not out there drinking. And therefore, it's a little hard to really understand that, okay, there are that many students that aren't drinking out there. Loyola, it's not a huge school, it's not a very small school, it's kind of right in the middle. So that's thousands of students that you might not ever interact with that choose not to drink at all. So keep that in the back of your mind, that there are students that abstain entirely. The other thing to remember is that most students are drinking at moderate levels. Um, some more data to throw at you, and I don't want to bore you with data, but students report that on average, the typical night when they go out, they're going to have between zero and four drinks. Zero and four drinks is still going to increase your BAC to a level that you're going to feel that buzz, and that's really what people search for, for the most part, when they choose to drink. They're looking for that buzz, they're looking for that relaxation, that warm feeling, the, the social aspect of it. And here at Loyola, we're actually seeing that most students choose to do that. And so I know we've heard some extreme cases. We hear people saying that, you know, there's a lot of mischief going on, there's a lot of transporta hospital transportations um, occurring. But it's not out of control here. And I think what we need to realize is that we can maintain that. We don't want it to get out of control. And so if we can continue to understand that students are drinking fairly responsibly for the most part, that's a message I want you to take away with you today and really understand that that's where Loyola should be at. Now, let's not get to the extreme and see these hospitalizations and transports increase. But that's really up to you guys. What's the message you're going to take back to the rest of the student body? I don't even think there's 1% of the student body represented here in this room today. So it's really up to all of you to wear your Good Samaritan t-shirts, to relay this message to the student body and help them understand that it's up to you guys to create that culture around alcohol here at Loyola. Um, some other things I wanted to touch on, um, Brendan, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Um, it takes a lot of courage to come up here and talk to people when you were put in that situation. Um, you mentioned BAC levels, and something I want you all to understand is that it doesn't take an extremely high BAC for you to end up in the hospital, for you to black out, for you to potentially suffer alcohol poisoning. Um, an effective dose of alcohol is between one and four drinks for someone. An effective dose means that's what it's going to take for you to feel the buzz. A lethal dose of alcohol can be anywhere between 10 drinks and 40 drinks for anybody. So that can increase your BAC to anywhere between a 0.1 to a 0.7. A 0.8, anyone's going to die at a 0.8 BAC. But I'll, for the most part, people that reach levels of a 0.5, about 99% of people can't tolerate that amount of alcohol in their system. And they're going to, their body's going to shut down, their central nervous system will stop working, and you will die from alcohol poisoning. Um, I usually don't share that information a lot of times just because it's kind of boring, but it really hits home with the stories that we've heard today. Really, what I want you to understand is that the Wellness Center and Health Promotion, we're trying to prevent this from occurring. And so we take a lot of measures. We do alcohol EDU. I know you guys probably don't love doing a three hour course on alcohol education, but it helps. It's proven to be effective. And it's not the only thing we're doing. We're also trying to get out there with postering campaigns. We do educational programming. We have peer educators that go out there into the res halls. We have health educators out there that are there to give you accurate information. And we also have um, student activities that do a wonderful job of providing alternative activities for students that aren't choosing to drink all the time and students that are looking for an alternative activity on a weekend when they decide, you know what, this just isn't the night that we're going to drink. So there's a lot of prevention that goes on here at Loyola. Um, it's not just about being reactive, it's about being proactive here. And really, in the end, it all comes down to what are you going to do. So we've talked about the Good Samaritan policy quite a bit. It kind of ties into a message I like to talk about, and that's bystander intervention. It doesn't have to get to the point where someone's really in need of the Good Samaritan policy, but you can step in at any point in the night and make sure that somebody is drinking responsibly, maybe they need to stop, and you're just looking out for them as a friend. And I think the next day, a friend's going to look back on that and really thank you so that they didn't end up in the hospital that night, so that it didn't come to a point where we had to talk about them as a student body because of no longer here. So thank you all for letting me be here. Thank you, Sarah. I think this is a great 
forum. I think it's a great event. I think it's a topic that we should always have in the back of our minds and something that we should bring to the rest of the student body. So thank you all very much. Okay, next up, thank you, Kevin. Um, we're going to have one more speaker, but before that, we just wanted to do a quick drawing. So here you go. This is uh, Dina and Mary Kay, also on res uh, yeah, Residence Live and Dining on Yoshie. So this is for Starbucks. The winner is <laughs> Adelina. <laughs> Okay, and then our last speaker, I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you is Tim Cunningham from Campus Safety. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. All right, I could barely hear most of the people. Can you guys hear me in back? Yes? Cool? Way back there, thank you. Um, my name is Tim Cunningham, and I work for Campus Safety. I'm the Student Community Liaison Officer. And uh, amongst a lot of my responsibilities, I'm also responsible for the student EMS program here on campus. Um, I know that um, Sarah asked me to speak about our enforcement of off-campus parties or busting up parties because that was evidently a concern expressed in the emails. Um, I know there's a lot of concern about the use of fake IDs. Um, our sting at Hamilton's a couple weeks ago got a lot of attention. Um, but I want to just clear up some um, information right now. Since August 21st, when Loyal EMS went into service for the school year, there have been 35 calls where the main complaint involved alcohol. 35. That's out of the 85 calls they've done, which include a stub toe or someone gets their iPod stuck in their ear. Um, out of 85 calls, 35 of them, the main complaint has involved alcohol. That is an incredible number. Last year we had 67 for the entire academic year. We're already halfway there, eight weeks into the school year. Um, what I want to point out is that these are calls that are brought to our attention by someone else. A lot of it has to do with the Good Samaritan policy. We are actually finding students who are calling us know about the Good Samaritan policy. And we're glad for that because there are some students who have been in very bad shape when we find them. And if they hadn't have contacted us, things could be much different, as in your case. We don't actively seek out people who are drinking, okay? I just want to make sure you know that. I've said this a lot before. We are not here to get you in trouble. Our job, more than anything else, is to keep you safe. Please, never hesitate to contact us if you do need help. Off-campus parties. Yes, we have increased our response to off-campus parties. And that's for a lot of reasons. One is that we're getting a lot of complaints from the neighborhood. Um, 50 people on a front porch at 3 in the morning drinking and throwing beer bottles on the sidewalk isn't what we expect from Loyola students. It shouldn't be what you expect from Loyola students. We also have a problem where there is an increase in underage drinking at an off-campus party versus going to a bar or um, you know a liquor store because how many off-campus parties have you guys been to where there's someone carding you at the door? probably doesn't happen that much, right? So we're finding that a lot of um, a lot of the sick person calls that are uh, alcohol-related calls we're getting are originating at off-campus parties. Um, sometimes we find them in a bush. Someone's just walking down the street and finds someone in the bush. Um, sometimes we, um, myself and Director Fine, who's sitting there in the, the crowd back there, we're out uh, the second or third weekend of school and we got flagged down by some people who just put someone in a taxi cab and the person couldn't even stand up on their own. They had to physically lift her up and put her into the cab. And we followed the cab for a couple blocks and it was like watching a pendulum bounce back and forth um, in the back window until we finally stopped the cab and sure enough she was very intoxicated and had to go to the hospital. Off-campus parties, um, in many ways, I have to talk about legal things, 
they are illegal. It is illegal to serve or provide alcohol to someone under the age of 21, okay? It is illegal to charge money for alcohol. And for everyone who thinks you're not charging for alcohol and you're charging $5 for a red Solo cup, that is also illegal. So anyone who might think they can skirt the rules by charging for a cup instead of a beer, it's not true. That is still illegal. Um, so that is why we do go after off-campus parties. Um, because the problems that originate from there, um, even though they occur off-campus, come to our front door very quickly and we have to address them. So that's why. Fake IDs. Anyone who's gone to Loyola in the past four years has had me talk to them at Discover Loyola. So I know you're not hearing this for the first time. Fake IDs are illegal. Fake IDs are a big problem here. It is a class four felony to have in your possession a fake ID. That means if you're sitting in this room and you have a fake ID on you right now, that is actually a felony offense. Um, charges for this were upgraded and um, they started making bigger deal out of it after 9-11 when a bunch of people hijacked planes with fake IDs. Federal government got involved and started putting in tougher restrictions on that. Um, yes, we did go over to Hamilton's a couple weeks ago and observe their carding process. And we did, what was it, I believe five, six IDs, something like that, we were able to retrieve. Those are five or six IDs that Hamilton's let these people into the bar with those IDs, and then we later were able to ascertain that they were in fact fake. Um, here in the city, a lot of people don't think fake IDs are that big of a deal. Uh, I know people personally who have gone out in the suburbs or have gone down to Bloomington, Champaign, uh, something like that, for a party and have gotten busted with a fake ID, you will lose your driver's license for a year, minimum. You're looking at a $10,000, up to a $10,000 fine. You're looking at possible jail time. Remember, this is just for possession. This is just for having it in your wallet. Um, I also have to talk about people who use someone else's real ID. Maybe it's your older roommate, your older cousin, your older brother, something like that. The law also states if you are improperly using someone else's ID, even in cases of trying to get into a bar or purchase alcohol, that is still a felony offense. So, a lot of people here um, might not want to realize that there are legal implications outside of this university. If you go down to Wrigleyville and get busted with a fake ID, we cannot assist you as much as if you were up here. And we want people to know that. We don't want you using fake IDs. You don't need a fake ID to have a good time. You don't need to drink to have a good time. Like Kevin said, if only one in four Loyola students is drinking, that's a few thousand students who are having a great college experience without ever having a drink. So I ask you, how is your college experience being made better by alcohol? But how is your college experience actually being made worse by alcohol? So that's what I have to say about that. Sarah will take over. I will be around for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, do we want to have another drawing? If you guys want to bring those over. And then um, now I want to open it up for Q&A, discussion, open forum. I mean, the name is open forum, right? I want. I want your guys' opinion. If this was the speakers were the introduction, and um, I'm going to invite the, you guys to go ahead and sit up here. Yeah, those of you who have spoken tonight, that'd be great if you could take a seat at the front, just so if anybody has questions about what you've addressed, um, we are right here, ready for the microphone. Let's see, is this everybody? Yeah, pretty much. Marco, you can come up if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to draw? This is for Subway, $10 for Subway, guys. Lauren Nava Sinan? Lauren Nava, cool. Are you done? <laughs> okay, next. Gabby, I'm so bad at last name. F, Gabby F. Gabby, are you in the house? All right, your guys' chances are going up. Tyler Geldernick. Tyler? Oh, yeah, there's one more Chipotle gift card and we're going to do that at the end. 
So, um, first question, everybody raise your hand. Yes, do you want to stand up? Yeah, of course. If you allow it. Yeah, I can project. Uh, I want to talk about the Good Samaritan policy. I had a question about it. Oh, two questions. Two questions, really? Yeah. Hello. Can I, all right, we're good now. All right, I have two questions about the Good Samaritan policy. Uh, the first one is, so if I, if I do have a friend who's too drunk and I report it, um, from what I read, not necessarily what was said, but from what I read, my information will still be taken down, and I still may be forced to inter have a health or educational intervention, which means the university still has the ability to make me go to a class or be sent to the hospital, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. But depending on the incident, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. So, so just to answer his question about um, the, the university forcing you to uh, go to a class or an intervention. I understand the concern. Um, yes, we absolutely are. We may, we may ask you to participate in something educational or developmental around alcohol or around drugs or whatever is appropriate for the incident. That is our request of you as a responsible and accountable community member, sans it going on your conduct history that you have been responsible for um, an alcohol charge, a drug charge, or such as it relates to the incident. Um, it's important to us that you are educated. It's important to us that you are informed. It's important to us that you are in the best place to make the best possible decision for yourself and for others. So yes, we will ask um, in certain circumstances where it makes sense to um, be involved in something educational or health intervention. We absolutely will. Um, but will you, I'm sorry. A health intervention is hospitalization, correct? Just so I'm clear? No, a health yeah. intervention might be um, meeting with a trained facilitator on basics. So you okay. can have a conversation about what are your responsible decision making, decision, um, what is your plan for responsible decision making around alcohol, which is two meetings with a trained staff member. Um, it may be working in your community to help them better understand responsible drinking. Like, those will be along the lines of a health intervention. No, we're not, we're not sending you to the hospital, and it won't just apply to students who've gone to the hospital. Okay. There was, a two, there was two yeah, questions, right? I had a second, I had a second question. Um, <laughs> My other question would be, um, in the, in the language here, it seems that the person who is reporting the incident could also be the person who the incident is about. Am I correct in saying that? Can I report that I am too drunk and I need to go to the hospital? Um, it seems in the language that you can do so. Tell me what you're reading. Yeah, I'll show it to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, so in your, it seems that the reporting student or students it doesn't have any exemption. Okay, I, you all heard his question, right, about the reporting student? Okay, so what he, I'll give you two explanations. One, if you are the student calling on yourself like, I need help, there's something wrong here, I think I drank too much, and you are looking to enact a policy that has you void of, um, university like obligations, that is considered medical amnesty. That is not in our university policy. Does that mean you don't call for help? Absolutely, of course not. Does that mean that you don't call if you are sick? Does that mean you don't call if you are in trouble? Does that mean you don't call because you are hurt? Absolutely not. As much as we trust you to support each other and to take care of yourselves, it's important that you trust us to work in your best interest. You must report it. Um, I, I want you to weigh whether or not you would take the chance that something extremely tragic can happen to you over coming to our office or talking to a conduct officer over a violation. I'm gonna pass this over to um, Kevin Meyer from Wellness who also sits on our CCAI community, uh, committee about this. Is there anything specific you'd like me to address? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's really the thing with the Good Samaritan policy, and here's one thing that, in case this is running through your minds, um, this policy can't be used and abused. So don't think that it's a get-out-of-jail-free card, first and foremost. Um, and if this were to occur multiple times with the same individuals, then you're not going to just be able to keep using the Good Samaritan policy. Obviously, you should still use it if it's reached a point where you should call for help. Um, but yes, by no means is it a medical amnesty policy. Um, it's a Good Samaritan policy. And really, it's just all about thinking in the, the grand scheme of things, what's going to be the best, the best route to take. Um, trust, trust everyone here. We are all here to help you. We are all here in your best interest. This is why we have groups that come together to address this issue, so that we can get input from everybody, so that we can get the wording right, so that we can get you to all buy into this. this we don't want you to not believe in the Good Samaritan policy. Um, and I think that by all of this great work that USGA is doing to help promote it, um, all the great work that our coalition has done to come together to really get it worded properly um, and to communicate that message to you guys, I think it's going to really help the health and well-being um, of the student body here and really show care for yourself, for others, and the community here. There's another question in the back, but I want to say, you know, in the, in the big scheme of things, and I love all the staff and the faculty and work really hard, if someone, if you, if you call for help and someone comes, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to you that would say, oh no, I don't want to call for a friend, or I don't want to call for myself because I'm so fearful of the alcohol paper I have to write or go talk to a counselor. You don't want a friend or yourself to die or get hurt. I mean, you're all smart people. You got into Loyola. You're committed to each other. The fear thing is what I want people to get past. I, I did a ride along with campus safety and Went, I went to a, one of the off-campus parties as an example, and as they were leaving, I stepped over a student. All her friends left her. She was passed out on the lawn. I later asked, what, you know, what was going on? And people said, well, I was afraid that I was going to get in trouble because I left her. So you didn't care that it was freezing outside, she wasn't dressed properly, she got sick. Great friend. So I want you to think about who are your friends, who do you want to be around? And again, not focusing on issues of fear, like I'm fearful I'm going to have to go talk to somebody. And again, it's just a conversation. There was a question. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having this. Um, I have been personally affected by alcoholism. My dad died from alcoholism. Um, that being said, I enjoy drinking. I am 21 years old and I like to have my beer when I want to have my beer. Um, and my question, I guess, is for Officer Cunningham or for Campus Safety. Um, I guess an issue we've been having lately is uh, Campus Safety doesn't exactly seem like your best friend right now. And I, from what I've heard, from what I've seen, people would much rather drink as much as they can so that they don't have to prolong the, the drinking process because campus safety will show up or um, will get you in trouble or whatever that is. Um, uh, also, like there's been a lot of, uh, like, I guess like personally, uh, some kind of a noise complaint or something and essentially my question is if there's a noise complaint and the police comes into my house and sees that there's six people who are 20 years old having a few beers, no music, no loud noise, is there no such thing as a warning anymore or is it automatically, because what I was told is it's procedures to take down your name, take down your information, which is fine, but then a few days later you'll get an email from student conduct, they'll bring you in, you have to sit through it all, and then you may or may not get a university warning, totally fine. However, if it happened again, then you may or may not get a fine. And these noise complaints should come in back to back when there'll be three people at home. And obviously, if it's a noise complaint, uh, we are more than happy to we understand. We, our students, there's people who live here who aren't students, totally fine. But sometimes they're completely out of line. And I know that uh, it's been happening a lot around campus. So campus safety might be a little fed up with it. 
and they don't even give people, uh, I guess, a chance to speak, uh, personally at least. And I was wondering, is there such thing anymore as a, a warning? Is it automatic procedure? If I come to the house, I'll lose a noise complaint and I hear no noise, do I still have to take down your information? Does it still have to go to the conduct? And if so, what happens when these noise complaints keep coming and nothing's happening? Are we going to continue to be fined, or how does that work? And then also, I guess I'll give it back to you. Is there like a sense of professionalism that campus safety should have while interacting with students? And if, if not, how do we go about maybe ensuring that that's being done? Okay, so the question is regarding uh, noise complaints specifically right here. Um, I'm going to let you know this right now. Campus safety does not walk around with a stethoscope putting it on doors of apartment buildings listening for noise. Every noise complaint we respond to, we are called by someone else. Sometimes they're the little old lady who lives in the building next door. Sometimes they're your fellow students who live downstairs who are, you know, sick of people stopping around making noise. That being said, if we get a noise complaint, if we are told to go to whatever street, whatever address, and there's a noise complaint on you know, the back porch. If we show up and there's no noise on the back porch, we're done, okay? If we get a noise complaint for the first floor and we go over there and there's no noise, we're done. Campus safety will only intervene or only knock on your door when they themselves also can substantiate the claim that was made before, okay? Um, I can tell you this, I know Cliff Goals, where are you at? Is he running around back there? Yeah. Oh, we went to the campus meeting. Cliff Golds is the uh, assistant dean for off-campus student living, and he um, rides along with us on a regular basis. And it is amazing what noise three people in their own apartment can actually generate, especially with the windows down, um, especially if you're you know, on an upper floor where you're walking around and some of these older three flats over here, those floors you know, squeak if you drop a grape on them. And that's kind of what noise complaints are actually being generated about. Um, the policy is, is that if we have to respond and interact with the student, we are going to go ahead and make a report on it, okay? What happens beyond that would be Dana's uh, department. So did I answer your questions there? And what else? Because I know you have several questions. Yeah. Professionalism. Yes. Okay. If you have a specific problem with the professionalism of their officers, you can come see me. You can come see Director Fine right back there. I work till midnight. Director Fine's here at 6 in the morning. This is a 12-hour day for him right now. I'm sure he's looking forward to getting out of here. But um, you can come talk to anyone in campus safety about that. If you are on the scene and you have a problem with professionalism and officer, you can ask to speak to a supervisor. There's always going to be a sergeant or lieutenant out there who will be able to come and talk to you and figure out what your complaint is and address it um, if need be. Okay? Any other questions that you've had that I can answer? Okay. Dana, do you want to talk about kind of the conduct process after a noise complaint? Um, for us in the office, we have this reporting system. Some of you have heard this field before. We have this reporting system where every incident um, involving a student of, from Loyola um, is put in this system. And we read these reports every day. All of these are reports that require uh, our action and our concern and our follow-up. So sometimes they are noise complaints in the community um, and, and a whole host of other things. Um, it is our policy to follow up. It is our, it is our um, commitment to this university and this student body to follow up. If we have an issue in the community, that's important to us. We live um, in an urban community. There is a neighborhood, there, is a, there are neighbors, there are commitments that are beyond this university. We're not one of those universities that's kind of off in, in the woods and on the prairies and, and by itself. Um, we have neighbors. We have neighbors with full-time jobs. We have them with families. We have them with commitments. And a lot of the community members enjoy Loyola being here. They also understand that it can be difficult because the college lifestyle is very different from their, their um, not in college lifestyle. So we take those seriously. And yes, we're going to ask you to come in and talk to us. Um, yes, we're going to ask about um, what actions you are taking to um, make sure this doesn't happen again. Yes, we're gonna ask you 
Do you have a relationship with your neighbors? Do you know them? Yes, we're going to ask you um, how you're monitoring what's going on in your home. That matters. Every decision that you make has an outcome. Your decision to maybe not take care of what may be going on around you, that comes with an outcome. Sometimes it is absolutely a consequence. So that's why we put it in our university policy, the good neighbor policy and the noise violation, just for those reasons. But yes, you are going to come to the office and um, we'll deal with it accordingly. And we make a judgment based on the circumstances of the situation and the students involved. What other questions do we have? Yes. So my question's for Officer Cunningham. That's okay. Um, I just have a quick question. In your, I'm a sophomore, and I live in a sophomore dorm. Um, and just for the record, I don't have a fake ID. And if we had to categorize my drinking level, it would be in the moderate one that we were talking about earlier. But you were saying that you're, you guys are cracking down on fake IDs. You're cracking down on off-campus parties. Are you encouraging us to drink in our dorms now? It just, it feels like, you know we're in college, you know that's going to happen, you know it's, it's improbable to think that, we're, that college students aren't going to drink at all, so what is your solution for this? I believe that's why everyone is here right now. Um, I don't think it is improbable to think that college students are not going to drink. Um, as we know, the statistics will tell you there's several thousand students here who do not drink. Um, to say that the problem cannot be solved is the problem. The culture of alcohol on a college campus is a problem that's going on in Georgetown and it's going on at UCLA. It's going on in Rome, it's going on right here in Loyola. What we are here for and what this conversation is about, it should not be how do I not get in trouble, it's how do I not drink to the point where I'm going to possibly get in trouble. There's a lot of people here who do drink. I know that. I'm not going to tell you don't drink. I'm not going to tell you I never drank when I was underage in college. I'm not going to lie to you. What we need to figure out, and this should be the, the venue, the forum that we do it in, is how do we get to that place where we're not having 35 students who are so intoxicated they have to go to the hospital? How do we get to that point? We have to crack down on fake IDs and off-campus parties because there are laws being broken. Campus safety is a legitimate police department. We are sworn police department within the state of Illinois. We can only turn our backs to so many things. And when we have a constant, ongoing problem with noise complaints, with fake IDs, with people stumbling home in the alleys, finding people passed out in the bushes, we need to start doing something. Campus safety, in a proactive way, unfortunately doesn't have as many opportunities as Residence Life does, as Oscar, as the Wellness Center. Campus safety has a legal responsibility that we have to follow through on. A fake ID is illegal. I don't want to say this, but you are very lucky to go to school in the city of Chicago because I know a cop who works for U of I in Champaign, who has literally thousands of fake IDs that he has you know, acquired in the past few years, probably past four or five years. Every single one of those students was arrested for those fake IDs. You can be arrested for a fake ID. You can be arrested for serving alcohol to a minor in your apartment. We don't want you to drink in the residence halls. We don't want you to drink off campus. We don't want you to drink at Hamilton's. We don't want you to drink to such a level that you become a problem. If you want to drink, sure, go ahead, do it. But remember, there are consequences for whatever it is you do. Okay? Anyone want to? Okay, Kevin wants to say something about that. Uh, essentially, so what Tim said was very, very good. Um, it's a harm reduction approach. Is that we? Well, that's what we take here through the Wellness Center. I think. Everyone on this panel would agree that it's a harm reduction approach. I'm never going to say just say no unless it was an extreme case. Um, and drinking is detrimental to your health at that point. Um, I do a lot of alcohol education. I've done it for the last six years. And I can stand here and with a huge screen behind me and give you an hour-long presentation on how to drink moderately, 
and what the benefits are of drinking moderately versus drinking high risk. And the thing that we should remember is that the vast majority of students are drinking moderately, and that it's a smaller percentage that are drinking to these high, high risk levels. And so, really, you just have to understand that you have to, you have to be bystanders. You have to watch out for your friends, those that understand the benefits of drinking moderately, instill those behaviors upon your friends, and don't feel the peer pressure that you have to outdrink somebody ever. You know, understand that. Once you've reached the level that you feel good at, you can stop. And essentially, there's just there's so many things that we can talk about and cover when it comes to alcohol use. But really, it's being a good friend, being a bystander, looking out for each other, understanding that we're not going to tell you no, but to understand that there are laws out there and that you have to be 21 for it to be legal to have any amount of alcohol in your system. But if you drink at a moderate level, the chances of you getting caught are going to be much, much lower. And the chances of anything negative happening to you health-wise, are also going to be much, much lower. And that's really what we're striving for, is to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and the health behaviors that you're practicing are the best ones that you possibly can at this point in time. Whether that's drinking moderately or not drinking at all, that's your choice. So, does anyone else want to speak to this? Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to have over here, I don't, since you guys have already asked one, I'm going to try and get everybody here, so. Hi, my name is Wula, but I have more of a question for Brendan, or Brandon, Brendan. Um, so I know, like, I think I speak for all of us when we say, welcome back, we're glad to have you. Um, for me, it's more, I guess it's harder for me to see, actually, a fellow student come up and talk about their experiences. I mean, we all like take alcohol EDU, we all roll our eyes at campus safety, and we get irritated um, with anybody saying like, oh, you need to drink reasonably. But it's so much more different to actually have a peer talk to us because they're more on our level. They don't look down on us, and for them to actually experience it, it makes us say, whoa, like, this really is real. This isn't just something that happened to somebody else. And you do seem like a smart guy, and it seems like you didn't know like what was happening to you and it just did get out of control and I've been at many parties where things have gotten out of control. My question for you is how has this impacted you? Thank you. Um, it's uh, really changed my life to the point where I've had to completely do a 180 you know about my like beliefs and you know what I thought was cool and, you know, you know what I usually do. Um, since the accident, I've uh, been completely sober. I haven't had a drink since getting out of the hospital. And uh, really, it's it's been nice because a lot of my friends have done the same. They've um, they've really you know cut down or they've stopped completely, and they've you know helped me out. Uh, you know, with on the weekends, you know, they we hang out together now. We don't do anything with drinks. You know, we go to the movies. We, play laser tag, we find other means, you know, to have fun without drinking. But um it's like it's really hard just um like after something like this, just uh walking around and trying to be normal. I mean, after almost dying, you know, you get a new perspective on life and I don't know, it's just kind of it's it's an adjustment and you know, gradually, like each and every day, I accept the fact that it's happened and, you know, try to put it behind me and move on. But, I mean, that's a good point bringing it up that, I mean, I remember freshman year when we were doing Discover Loyola, um, just, oh, you know, you should mark your arm for how much alcohol you should drink and they tell you these tips and, you know, you, I never thought I needed to do that. I never thought, hey, I'm going to lose count and then just get into a situation. But, you know, it only takes one time when you're drinking for you to forget something or for you to lose complete control and end up in a situation where you almost died. So just, you know, keep that in mind when you're drinking. You know, it may, you may think it can't happen to you, but very well can. So. Thank you. Um, next questions. We have two women over here. I'm going to go ahead and walk back. Um, I know, like, everybody's trying to like, drink safe and you have, like, a sober friend, but isn't it true that if you're, like, the sober friend in 
at a place or like in the dorm or like at a party that isn't drinking but there is alcohol in the room, don't you get written up too? So isn't that kind of like a hard thing to decide what you should do with? You guys heard that correct? Yes. Okay. This you, Dana? I'm going to try to answer this from what I think I heard you say. Um, were you asking in regards to the Good Samaritan policy or in general? Okay, so I think she's taking the tip, but I'm going to be the sober person in the room to like make sure that everybody's doing the right thing and that we're okay and we're taken care of. Um, and then I guess maybe it gets reported because you're in the residence hall and you get written up because you are in the presence of alcohol. So it feels like a catch-22. I can understand that. That makes, that makes sense, and I, and I hear you. Yes, the policy is um, if you are under the age of 21, you are not to be in the presence of alcohol. Um, I understand that what you're attempting to do is um, be the one that takes care of the group, be the one of sober mind and can manage what's going on. I respect that, I acknowledge that. What I want to say is um, this, this idea of responsible drinking, this, this forum, from what I understand, I didn't come here under the pretense that I'm telling you don't drink. Don't drink because you're underage. I don't, that's absolutely not my frame of mind, even when I have hearings, I don't, I don't have that position. My position is why I'm going to ask you, like, what is responsible drinking? Is this typical for you, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing that I'm going to talk to you about is, like, your decisions and how you came to, um, to make the decisions that you made for yourself. That's going to be difficult. I will be honest. Um, I understand that that seems to be protective, but you are putting yourself at a risk. That is a choice. That is absolutely a choice. Would you um, make the choice to not look out for your friends versus not getting in trouble? I hope not. Um, and I hope that you would be able to come to the office and talk to us about the incident. I hope that any decision that you make, for whatever reason, you can come to, if it's reported that you can come to the office and talk to us about why you made that decision and um, what you were expecting. I don't know if that kind of answers your question, or not, but please, like if it doesn't, let me know. So she's saying that we're preaching responsible drinking, responsible drinking, and that effort to be the sober one in the room is the effort towards responsible drinking. Um, I, I want to be clear, and I'll, I'll look to you all to like back me up on this. When I talk about responsible drinking, yes, I want you to have a buddy. Yes, I don't want you to drive. Yes, I don't want you to get on the L by yourself. Um, but what, really what I mean is just drinking in moderation. What I mean is that one standard drink per hour. That to me is the responsible drinking that, that I'm really promoting. I'm promoting being in moderation. I'm promoting not getting, not drinking so much that you get yourself sick. Not drinking so much that you pass out. Not drinking so much that you can't control yourself. Um, not drinking so much that you hurt yourself or someone else. That, that is um, my interpretation of responsible drinking. Um, putting safety nets around you so um, you can drink as much as you want to and hope you have coverage that's a risk that you're taking. I'm promoting here today in moderation, if you are going to do it. I'm promoting today that you stay safe. The Good Samaritan policy is about not losing a student's life over your alcohol. Um, this idea of um, the trouble being the issue, that's not really the issue. I need you all to be healthy. I need you all to be here. I need you all to finish your career at Loyola with your degree. Thank you. Um, questions, questions. All right, guys, looks like I'm going back over here. Do you want to ask one first? Uh, yeah, just a quick Okay. Um, I, I don't want to bring it up, but I feel like she's... Oh, that's... 
Um, her question is something like that. What, what she was asking is, if you're being responsible and you're trying to take care of your friends by being the sober person, why do you still get in trouble uh, for being in the room? That's what she was trying to say. It's the law. Right. I mean, like, I, here's the thing. I, I, I will not make any allowances for you because you are a college student. We are not going to make any allowances for you because you're a college student. We're not going to make any allowances for you because you have the privilege of being at a university. You, I'm not going to make any privilege or exceptions for you because you go to Loyola University Chicago. That would be an exception. Our university policy, our community standards, is if you are under the age of 21, you are not to be in the presence of alcohol, period. That's just it. That's a decision that you make. That's a calculated risk you try to take. That does not negate being responsible and being moderate about your drinking. That does not negate being safe. That's a decision that you have to make. You are all adults. You are not children. You are not kids. As adults, we expect that you think ahead about your decisions. And whatever comes with that decision, you move forward with it. So if you're going to take that calculated risk, and take the consequence, then by all means, that's your decision. But what we're asking for is that you be safe. We're not going to change our university policy to make it easy for you to go against the law. Like that, that we're saying, like what Tim is saying and what Kevin's saying, this is the law. We're not making this up because you're here. All right, I think I'm going to do one more question here, Lewis. You can finish off my question. But essentially what I was going to ask is, how does the, is the university concerned at all that by cracking down so hard, people are going to move further and further away from campus? And speaking of drinking responsibly and getting on the L and all this stuff, we're just going further and further. Or not per se me, but people are just going to go further and further from campus. So I understand cracking down and like doing what you got to do. But like I said, I'm a firm believer on warnings because people may call for anything. If you come and there's six people who are 21 having a few years, it's kind of a situation where you say, you know what, keep it down. If I have to come back, I'll write you off. I don't think it should be the first thing you guys do. But again, I don't make these rules. Um, but I'm just concerned that people are going further and further away from campus, and it's going to be much more dangerous than what it is right now. Yes, absolutely. One of our concerns is that if we make it so that way, let's just say around campus isn't as friendly as it used to be, that people are going to start going down to Lincoln Park. They're going to start going to Wrigleyville. They're going to start going to Rush Street and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, you know, we take care of our, our area right here, and that's what our focus is on. Campus safety only goes up to Pratt, only goes down to Glen Lake right here. Um, but that being said, we have had police officers from Wrigleyville drive students up here and drop them off at campus safety. Okay? DePaul, their security, has called us in the past and said, we got one of your students here. What do you want to do with them? Okay? Um, yes, it's obviously a concern that we're going to start pushing people further and further away. But the vast majority of students are still staying here. They're still living right over here on North Shore, Columbia, wherever they may be. They're still choosing to drink with um, local. The number of students who are actually you know, hopping on a train and going elsewhere, it's probably no different than the number of students who live over in Fairfield who up on the Granville Red Line take it up here to Loyola and go to uh, a party on North Shore, um, and vice versa. So it is a calculated risk of, you know, if we push everyone away from here, we can't keep them as safe as if they were just staying here. But, like I said, the overwhelming majority of students are still hanging out in this area, still drinking this area as well. Okay, um, if there's no pressing questions after this, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up um, with a close, well, we have one final drawing. Um, yeah, Jane, I'm sorry, I didn't ever introduce, if you guys don't know, this is Jane Newfield, the Dean of Students, go ahead. Thank you. I'm just standing in for Dr. Kelly, who had to leave early. Um, I just want to remark that um, this, I've never seen such enthusiasm and care around an issue. Um, I was telling Sean beforehand, with student government, often it's them against us, and we've done something wrong, and they, you know, they, they kind of come after us. I, I think the enthusiasm and putting this together, I'm in my 23rd year at Loyola, and I've never seen something like this happen, where we're all kind of somewhat on the same page and have the same understanding. So, um, and in my 23 years here, 
I, I have some pretty scary stories. I'm just looking out, I was looking out the window and I was thinking about a student a couple years ago who was found on the L tracks and was only only safe because the train conductor saw him and got him. He had been laying there since the train before. So I tell you that not to freak you out, but but I've seen a lot and we've been very, very lucky in terms of student deaths around alcohol. I also live in the neighborhood too, so I hate to see you all move away, but in some ways it would be nice and quiet. Um, <laughs> Brendan, I just I can't say enough, and, and whoever I think she left, um, to have we can talk on and on about, you know, don't do this, don't do that, or do moderation, but to hear from a student, their firsthand experience goes a lot further than me, Jamie Fell, telling you, you know, what to do. So I just applaud this gathering and Sarah for pulling this together and for everyone on the on the panel. So thank you for coming out. We're going to do one final drawing, Jane, if you want to do the drawing for this. Um, and here at Sean Bear for some closing words of, this is our student body president, if you guys don't already know. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, first of all, let's give Sarah and the Residence Life and Dining Committee a big round of applause for their work. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lecture you. Um, my 21st birthday isn't until January, and I'm not going to claim that I've been a perfect angel in my three and so years here. Um, I know people and, uh, who have been a hot mess at times, and uh, you know it's uh, it's not you know nobody's perfect. So I'm not going to lecture you about it. The thing I think that the big takeaway is uh, you know no not drinking is an option for some people. Uh, some drinking is an option for some people. Binge drinking and getting blackout drunk should never be an option for anyone. Um, and, you know, we're here uh, to care for you guys. All these people here are here at 6.30 in the evening uh, because they care about you guys and they care about the students. Um, so it's not a us versus them situation. Uh, it's not a students versus administrators situation. We're all working together for the same goals. So we want to keep that in mind. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this is really a really great turnout. I really appreciate everybody being here and being engaged. Um, just uh, there's some t-shirts left if you haven't gotten one after we're done um, and so yeah thank you very much for coming
correct. Whatever. Um, and, that, and, that's, and that's on us. The vast majority of noise complaints are, I don't want anyone to come, I don't want, or I don't want anyone to come talk to me, I don't want to make videos, I just read them. You know, uh, which is completely fine. But still has to be See, if West did in order to authorize an essential search for that Correct. So, if I request, if I have an apartment, and someone says, I'm going to come in and I ask my senior to complain, are you refusing to come in anyways? Well, I mean, you won't be able to physically see it because at that point it's nothing but a phone call. Phone call is made to a dispatch center. Dispatch center then dispatches an officer. So there's nothing physical, tangible right then and there. I, and I understand that, and, and, and I get that. It's still going on. That it doesn't matter necessarily in the overall terms of the request to have physical documentation for this book. Because you don't have a, a site, a physical site, you don't have to leave it this way. How would you go about talking, making sure that our rights are protected? Even if it's a noise complaint, it's not a problem. We want to be If we get a noise complaint, which under that would be a disorderly conduct. Right, yes. Which is a crime. And we show up and we hear the noise and we deem it to be the actual thing that's in there. Then yes, that is enough to get into that building. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of different schools of thought about this. There's people who say, no way to help you out of my house. At that point, we don't need a physical written warrant from a judge. Because if that was the case, then you know, the Chicago police wouldn't be allowed to come in somewhere to talk to They wouldn't be able to uh, just walk in. Yeah, yeah, I thought maybe if you hear, if you're living in your house and you hear some shotgun fire, oh, yeah, 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 that's absolutely acceptable. So it's on a much less severe. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not talking about a huge rate of the block people. I was literally in a lot of six people. Oh my god, that thing! There was no possibility that a decibel level could have been able to warrant any noise complaint. And I'm curious as to how that happens to me. It's not a huge party, but I get a perfect problem. I'm in a place where I don't think I have a There needs to be some kind of challenge process to this. There needs to be and now, so if I do that, I'm sorry, what is the officer's duty? Must, if someone requests a sergeant, you have to show up. Uh, the supervisor, they have to stay, I need to show Can they continue, as the officer, can they continue the search without the sergeant? Yes. 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 Yes.
Oh, yeah. Yeah. 